As we continue to look at ethics and journalism practice, today we take a look at photojournalism and the fact that everyone who has a camera through a smartphone can point and click without thinking twice about the repercussions of their actions. In some cases, it works for the good of those who are captured, and in other cases, it really does not necessarily render assistance to those persons who are generally in need at that particular point when that person is actually capturing the photographs. As you would see in today's lecture, you'll notice that issues around George Floyd's um, you know, demise and some, some other issues that might have occurred years earlier were as a result of citizen journalists and their ability to capture the unfolding events around those cases that occurred in the United States. Now, not every instance of photojournalism really is what is deemed to be ethical, but I'd like us to watch together um, exactly what might have been transpiring in the past and how one particular photojournalist has been able to capture the events of the refugee crisis for the good of those of us who cannot see and appreciate exactly what is unfolding as a result of the war in Ukraine. So let's watch together. The growing refugee crisis in Ukraine is now Europe's largest since World War II, and it's only getting worse. CBS's Sunday Morning's Lee Cowan takes a look at the exodus through the eyes of a photojournalist who puts the lives of the nearly four million refugees into focus. The desperation of those fleeing is hardly a black and white issue. And yet, these black and white photos are so powerful in their simplicity. I like to work very close to people. I like to look people in the eye. In that fleeting exchange of a stranger's glance, award-winning photojournalist Peter Turnley has captured the human condition in Ukraine better than words ever could. I saw, of course, sorrow, despair, incredible sadness, but I didn't see any form of hysteria. I saw a lot of strength. I noticed so many mothers and, and children holding on to each other. But it was while photographing the old that he realized that the wisdom that comes with age was here, at least, a burden. And I thought, what would it be like at the very last moments of one's life to be so terribly alone and so dependent on the help of others? In the days since Turnley left Ukraine, the flood of refugees has only grown. So many people have so little and have lost everything. And I actually don't know if, if I would have the same strength to endure the same thing. Wouldn't it be nice if Peter Turnley did return to Ukraine to photograph not pain, but peace? Lee Cowan, CBS News. All right, so that was the way in which war times are captured, the way in which war crimes, um, you know, unfold but yet photographers are on the scene in a very sensitive way to show the rest of the world what is happening excuse me so i will now share my slides with you to get into today's session proper in relation to what is happening in the context of photo journalism now today's reading, the required reading, really is chapter eight, picture this, the ethics of photo and video journalism. Trust if you've all read, if you have not, please do so by the end of today's lecture and please access the NPEA's code of ethics. Of course, this code of ethics has to do with code conduct that professional journalists and photographers are expected to utilize as they practice their trade. Now, Civil War imagery of the 1860s, um, in the ethics of photojournalism, the history and evolution, really, you know, emerged as a result of the exercise of the First Amendment because it was felt that people needed to see exactly what was happening during the Civil War. And so a lot of stolen images are what was called at that time yellow journalism on the right to privacy 
some sort of debate would have emerged around that time during the 19th century. And quite a few misappropriation lawsuits were actually um, filed as a result of what was happening in the context of people's clicking and actually posting and making imagery available. And so Marshall McLuhan, for those of you who are media studies scholars or students, you will notice that he really viewed technology very dimly back in 1964 when he said that technology can be regarded as weapons. If this was before the digital era, um, can you imagine what McLuhan would be saying today as a result of what we are seeing captured live and streamed live in the context of all the events that are unfolding from those who are engaged in mass shootings to those who are engaged in other types of atrocities around the world. Now, in the photographs that are here captured, you will notice that the kneeling on the neck that really went viral globally um, was actually captured by someone who just took out a phone, a smartphone, and they took everything. Um, I believe she was awarded subsequent to this particular incident. And so technology was really a weapon that was used to, I would say, uh, you know, bring these particular things to justice, these um, excesses, as people would call them, to justice, to the light, to the public light, knowledge, so that the world can see exactly what is happening. And so technology has also weaponized people and citizens and mobilized so that the entire government, entire revolutions have, you know, been birthed um, as a result of how, how people have used cameras, how they have used cell phones, how they have used whatever is available to them to say to the rest of the world, this is what is happening in my neck of the woods. And so citizens as photojournalists have emerged over time, specifically, I would say in the last 15 to 20 years, it's become a widespread phenomenon. And cell phone photography, specifically in social media, have provided rapid news, real-time news for a lot of people who would have otherwise remained in the dark. And so questions that emerge are, should people just shoot and post and go live? And should we trust what we see as a result of that particular shooting and posting and going live? Um, most of you who would have followed up or if you are aware of cases that might have occurred in the past, um, specifically the issues that occurred in the last year, um, I believe that the shooter went live with the Buffalo supermarket shooting. Um, the young lady, the person who actually shot um, in the Tennessee um, shooting recently that occurred, um, I believe there was a plan to also carry the incident live. And of course, way back before we could have had the capacity to do the live feeds and live streams, the Rodney King beating was actually captured on an amateur video. And of course, it sent off riots in Los Angeles based on citizens' recordings. So we see that the empowerment of masses through the ability of citizens to use whatever available technologies are available to them to show what was happening, it has really created inroads in terms of making people aware of different atrocities, like I said, that have been occurring in the past, but that might be otherwise unknown to the public. Now, citizens as photojournalists will have emerged around, I would say 2005, um, not that they weren't available before, there weren't citizen journalists, but the imagery with the London bombings in 2005 really brought this particular issue to the fore for the world to see exactly what would have transpired and the depth of the damage and the destruction and the mayhem that was caused as a result of the London bombings. And so this created the way for open source journalism, meaning that citizens would have collected and archived the content and they would have made this available for journalists to actually access. Now, what about the ethics of photography and video journalism? Ethical issues will more than likely affect everything that we do in this particular field called communication and media studies. And of course, the visual communication field is now subject to a whole lot of scrutiny as a result of technology. And because new technology influences news photographers and graphic designers, they have got to take extra precaution and care in how they apply the technology to actually hone their craft and to produce content because journalists are really engaged in what we call social really representation our construction of reality, all right? And the question emerges for us, yeah, you know, around whether different standards and assumptions in the news business apply to those in advertising or public relations. We shall get to that 
in the next two modules or so. Um, the, the, the truth is that all journalists, all media professionals should be held to the same standards of truth and applying photography rather than manipulating images. But like I said, we will get to that um, when we come to the modules that are addressing advertising and public relations. Now, technology, <laughs> it can be a good and it can be bad at the same time. It has provided significant opportunities for those in visual communication fields to actually showcase their talent. And of course, ethical concerns accompany those particular skills that are associated with those who work in visual communication fields. Um, specifically those who work in advertising, there has been a lot of debate around whether it is ethical for them to actually lie and to actually show someone um, looking quite different or to actually reveal or to advertise on the basis of a lie that is actually known to be a lie and not the true representation of that particular imagery or person. And so that's an ethical issue. Next, let's look at how video and photojournalism really, um, you know, these have emerged in Hollywood and in other spaces to actually come to the fore in terms of what is actually occurring. In the past, really, it was assumed that a camera never lied and that a, a, photo, a photograph or videotape could be used as an accurate record of events. No longer that um, in terms of what is happening right now, that's no longer the case. Software such as Photoshop, you know, these types of uh, software, they have made it possible for manipulations to happen. And then we think to the naked eye that a lot of what we're seeing is actually real. And of course, it creates some sort of stirring and excitement. Now, for the person who is not familiar with these particular types of software, it is very, very, very easy for them to be duped into believing a lie. For those persons who were actually there and they were gravitating towards imagery, I would say during the COVID-19 pandemic, in the height of the pandemic, and they would have seen images of this is what happened to someone, or even if it's non-pandemic related, and someone wants to do some sort of fee repeal um, to a particular group of people, you, you'll find that a lot of what we call um, photoshopping has occurred to actually reveal that this is what happened to one celebrity who has not been taking care of his or her health. And in many instances, it's really a matter of photoshopping and it cuts really at the heart of the unethical practices of those who in the advertising industry to actually give you what is called a clickbait so that you can check to see exactly what is happening in someone's life. How can that person deteriorate from one year to another looking like that? It's sometimes all a matter of photoshopping. Now, there are two ways to look at visual images. We say as a window in which the photographer or videographer captures the moment with no attempts to alter it. So it's totally unfiltered. It is as you see it, what you see is what you actually get in terms of that particular visual image. Then there's the visual image that is seen not as a window, but as a mirror where anything can be manipulated as long as the photographer is attempting to subjectively recreate the setting. And you will see in the images here, there is a filter, the person looks flawless. And of course, the edited versus the unedited, unedited version where the person is actually looking much lighter than they really are in real person and up close and personal or in real life, all right? Many persons are actually engaged in doing this type of journalism when they're recreating scenes and stuff like that. Um, for leisurely purposes, you'll find that there are photographers who are actually doing this. There are persons who do this by themselves because they want to create for imagery. Um, in some cases, there's a lot of catfishing going on with a total alteration of what the person actually looks like. But when it comes to recreating the setting, you will find that visual imagery and images really um, apply the mirroring effect so that the persons who are pivoted towards in terms of the audience, the target audience, they're actually there and they're grabbed and hooked as a result of the filters. Now, it has been assumed in the past that news photographers and video photos, especially those, um, those that are in daily newspapers are on network news or were actual windows, meaning that what you see is what you got and it's the exact imagery. But a lot of cases now, there, there, there are quite a few people who are looking at things or images that are not windows. Now, news magazines in the past were also assumed to be windows, although there were a couple of exceptions to the rule. In the context of feature or entertainment magazine photos, these were often the mirror 
and of course variety they provided variety while advertising quotas were definitely mirrors so we see here in entertainment types of products in the context of media you don't necessarily have anything there that says this is how the person looks in real life all right in some cases the image of the person looks a little lighter um, there is a light enhancement in terms of the photography and there have been a couple of cases where um, persons have complained about not necessarily recognizing themselves when they're carried on specific magazines so these are mirrors that are used for entertainment purposes of course to get the magazine to sell um vogue and all of these different types of magazines you will find that that's not exactly the tone of the individual who is actually on the cover of that magazine because really you want to show or capture the person at their best or to sell the magazine so to speak and there are a couple of examples as well that are there now digital manipulation is a an ethical issue for all of us all of you who are working in visual communication fields and of course, the, the, the types of photographic manipulation, it's, it's not very new. So you've got cropping, you've got burning, you've got dodging, and you've got airbrushing that occurs. All of these occur at a very regular rate, all right? Today, what we're seeing are images actually moving seamlessly into each other to create what is called a realistic but totally false visual image. And this particular image here on the screen is an example of what is happening right now in the context of reimagining or reimaging um, these particular types of visuals. Now, uh, the window, a uh, mirror distinction is often blurred whenever you have magazines that are actually airbrushing or they're manipulating the imagery. And so the question is, who is the real person? Um, there is an example here of a misrepresentation and an apology that was issued by MSNBC. I'd like to play that for us to, to hear. I hope that I can do so with as minimal disruption as possible. Um, I'm going to open the hyperlink and hopefully it plays so that we can see exactly how these particular things might have occurred in the past. And they're probably still pretty much occurring. Play that. All right, so as a result of the technical difficulties, I'm going to skip that and I'm going to ask that you actually access that particular example of what has transpired in the past in terms of the misrepresentation that sometimes occur on the newscast that we're seeing in the context of advertising and how it is that persons are very guilty of actually um, speaking on behalf of and showing imagery that are not truthful. Now, in today's reading, um, we see that one example of electronic manipulation by, you know, Zitong, a British-based Jewish newspaper, really um, gets against or goes against the whole grain of, um, I would say, this whole notion of living in a very patriarchal society and lying to people. Now, Z, you know, the Zitong really removed Secretary Clinton's image from the Situation Room during the Bin Laden killing. Um, due to religious beliefs. They didn't believe that a woman should be really in a setting with men because this is really a man's world. This is not for you to be here up close and personal, even though you were Secretary of State at the time. And so they cropped, they removed the image, and you will see here the image to the left. She's right there. Um, but it was announced that he was captured and killed. And then to the right, she's actually out of the image. What they did, they actually, you know, issued a disclaimer for her disappearance. And I believe that there was an eventual apology. All of this is on the basis of religious beliefs in terms of a woman's place in a situation room. Now, I wash aesthetics and I would say ethics. These have no association to context. And of course, aesthetics and ethics philosophies, if you look at what Hodges is actually saying, he notes that visuals are based on opinion, <coughs> excuse me, and they create ethical clashes. Truth and good are actually easier to present. And for Duncan, very early, um, he said that good and bad are subjective concepts that lead to naturalistic fallacies as it relates to aesthetics and the ethics of imagery that we put out there. 
So everything around what we will actually appreciate based on what our eyes see are subjective. It's like saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And so again, if the photographer does not see beauty in the image and he thinks or he, that particular photographer who thinks that they need to recreate as a result of what the world may want to see as beautiful, then for Duncan, it really has to do with, you know, good and bad and the naturalistic policies that we've created for ourselves in this particular world that is so materialistic, all right? So the creative, for Hodges, the creative is really what trumps um, whatever we see out there. It is good, he says, and truths that are easier to present rather than this whole notion of ethical um, notions of truth and right. So ethical clashes will happen if you're thinking through what Hodges is actually saying here about truth and good, rather than something that is actually very ugly to reveal to the rest of the world. Now, Byron has here a checklist. If you check page 256 in your required reading, you will see that he says to check for intru intrusive or revealing photos, we should ask the following questions. Should the moment be made public in the context of the photography? Should persons be able to see exactly what is happening, even if it's a very gory issue, if it's uh, very deleterious? What is happening right now in the context of photography is the fact that people are just clicking. And of course, they want to have following and likes and stuff like that. But many do not necessarily think about the fact that you are capturing somebody's moment there in trauma. You're capturing something that is really very um, egregious for a particular group of people. Should you make that particular moment public? And when you do so, are you helping those persons who are victims of a particular incident? Um, let's say you're capturing a massacre that is happening at the time. Should the moment be made public for everyone to know exactly what is happening in the context of that particular atrocity? And then the second question is, will subjects be exposed to further trauma? Are you helping them or are you exposing them? And then of course you are actually re-victimizing them. And in some cases there is a shock that will be passing through those persons who will be viewing because you've not necessarily desensitized um, them, you have become desensitized yourself to those particular images as a photographer, and you've forgotten the sensitive nature of the trauma that you're exposing people to as they view those particular images. So issues of the public right to know, need to know, and want to know what are you doing with the images as it relates to, you know, taking care that it doesn't cause further harm. And of course, the question is, am I at least obtrusive at an obtrusive distance as possible from the particular incident that is happening and am I acting with compassion and sensitivity. There is a story that is told recently of a guy who actually went to take a photograph as a, 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 a as a train actually bore down on someone who was caught in the train tracks and the question that was posed to him did you think it was the right thing to do to actually capture that particular person about to be crushed rather than actually trying to help them off of the train tracks. And so the desensitization of people who are capturing and clicking, it's a question of the ethics and it's a question of harm over their right to actually show the public what is happening and their right to render assistance in a compassionate and insensitive manner. Now, Bovi also provides six means and ends questions on page 258 and this has to do with how we're doing what we're doing as photographers and what ends are we trying to create? And so one of the questions has to do with are the means morally evil or distasteful? Are we actually harming people just to get the clicks and the likes and get the pulse rather than trying to help them? Is the end really or apparently good? Will the means achieve the end? Is the same good possible using other means or is the bad means a shortcut? Is the good end greater than any evil means used to attain it? And will the means used to attain the end withstand the test of publicity? Of course, the story that I just told you, there was public outrage about the way in which the photographer just jumped into action to capture the guy who was about to be crushed without even thinking, can I actually possibly help him? All right. Now, there's a code of ethics I'd like you to take into account of the NPAA code of ethics. This has to do with visual journalists and those who manage visual news productions should be accountable for upholding the public standards in their daily work. And this has to do with the ability, uh, you know, the responsibility rather to be accurate and comprehensive 
in the representation of all subjects. Next, they also need to resist being manipulated by stage photo opportunities, and they need to be complete and provide context when photographing or photographing or recording subjects. Avoiding stereotypes in terms of individuals and groups, and of course, the need to recognize and work to avoid presenting one's own biases in the work. Treat all subjects with respect and dignity. Give special consideration to vulnerable subjects such as children. And this is, this is an image of a child uh, that was captured during the Syrian crisis. And of course, compassion has to be shown. This particular photographer who captured this image was able to get this child's assistance. And of course, they were able to um, have someone sponsor or I would say um, adopt this child. So there was compassion and assistance rendered to this particular vulnerable subject. Um, again, they're not to intrude on in private moments of grief. Only when the public has an overriding and justifiable need to see that image, then they should show the image. And of course, the question of photographing, photographing, while um, you know, photographing subjects, they ought not to intentionally contribute to alter or seek to alter or influence the events around that particular photography. Editing should maintain the integrity of the, photo the photographic images, content and context. Do not manipulate images or add or alter sounds in any way that can mislead viewers or misrepresent subjects. And these codes really pertain to those of you who might say, I want to actually settle down into a job that has to do with photography. These particular codes should be used and cited as part of your own ethical philosophy that you will create, all right? Number seven in terms of the code has to do with not paying sources or subjects or rewarding them materially for information or participation. Do not accept gifts, favors, or compensation from those who might seek to influence coverage. Do not intentionally sabotage the efforts of other journalists and do not engage in harassing behavior of colleagues. Um, subordinates or subjects and maintain the highest standards of behavior in all professional interactions. Ideally, visual journalists should strive to ensure that the public's business is conducted in public and of course, defend the rights of access for all journalists. They should think proactively as a student of psychology, sociology, politics, and art to develop a unique vision and presentation. They should also work with a voracious appetite for current events and contemporary visual media. There's also the need to strive for total and unrestricted access to subjects, recommend alternatives to shallow or rushed opportunities, seek a diversity of viewpoints, and work to show unpopular or unnoticed points of view. Meaning there is something called photo voice where you're showing all sides. You're showing the good and the bad. You're capturing the entire context of that particular community. So the public is, is actually aware of what, what is happening in that particular underrepresented community. There is the need to avoid political, civic and business involvement or other employment that compromise or give of the appearance of compromising one's own journalistic independence, meaning that you're not going only to sites and sounds and particular locations that will show that particular company in a good light, but you need to actually show the environmental degradation and the damage and the pollution and all the other photography that will really illustrate what is happening, um, you know, to the detriment of a particular group of people or the habitat. So it is very important that uh, a photographer really does not get into business involvement to show a company or a particular establishment in a positive light, really by um, not necessarily capturing those images that reveal the complicity that might be at play there, um, really to the detriment of a community or a group of people. Strive to be unobtrusive and humble in dealing with subjects, respect the integrity of the moment, and of course, strive by example and influence maintain the spirit and high standards expressed in this particular code. Meaning that when you're confronted with situations in which the proper action is not clear, seek the counsel of those who exhibit the high standards of the profession. And finally, visual journalists should continuously study their craft and the ethics that guide it. Uh, I, I, I'd like to encourage you to go to all the readings and the videos that are assigned to the module, this module, as well as the one before that I spoke about in terms of the ethical um, issues around social media. And of course, I'd like you to go to the preamble in the code at hdsnpa.org, code of ethics. And this especially applies to those of you who might want to 
actually have your code created around the issues of visual journalism, having identified this as your particular forte or what you'd like to actually go into as you consider and think about um, a career of your choice. All right. Now, please continue to work on your ethics in the news presentations. Uh, those are coming up uh, in another couple of days. We're crossing over. And as we head to the end of the semester, I'd like you to think about anything that is happening right now. There's so many events that are happening right now in the news that are really, um, I would say, um, very suitable for interrogation and for examination so that you are really examining what is happening ethically, what particular codes are being breached, and how we can actually better understand um, the representation or the misrepresentation that is occurring, whether it's on an online platform or I would say a traditional platform such as radio or television or print. We'd like to see what you have and of course your posts eventually.